Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Everything Horror Podcast. My name is Paul Dosky, as always, and with us today, we have a nice special guest. And you may know his voice from the little segment that we added to R.H. Grimley when he was able to talk to us about his experiences and the good times of working on the Wild Man of Shaggy Creek audiobook. But anyway, I need to shut up. Let's get him on board so we can just hear his experiences even more. And that is B.J. Wimpy. B.J., welcome back again. For your, but this time... Hi, everyone. Yeah. It's great to be here on the Everything Horror Podcast. Uh, excited to be back. And yeah, let's get this interview going. So, BJ, as you know, as always, and you probably have heard this plenty of times yourself, is for those listening and for like somebody like me who had never heard of you until recently, um, give us a little brief bio of who you are. All right, I can definitely do that. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is BJ Wimpy. Uh, I am an actor, a voiceover artist, and an audiobook narrator. Um, I've been acting since before I could walk. One of my first uh, roles as, as a uh, the baby Jesus in the nativity scene. Um, I uh, have been acting ever since then, and I love it. I got into voiceover work several years ago, and it, it was always a dream of mine to you know be the voice of cartoon characters growing up. I haven't gotten quite there yet, but I'm hoping it it will happen in the future. I got into audiobook narration just a few years ago as well. Um, I actually started right before the COVID pandemic hit. And luckily, you know, audiobook narrating was able to kind of sustain me through all of that because most of my acting jobs disappeared during that time. But audiobook recording, since I can do it at home in my own studio, was still thriving. And so I was able to pick it up and start doing audiobooks. And I've always loved listening to audiobooks, so it was great to finally uh, be behind the mic and, you know, getting to create with all these amazing authors. Um, I'm a Utah local. I act here, like, in live productions as well as commercials, uh, TV, and video. And that's BJ Wimpy in a nutshell. If you want to learn more, you can always go to my website, bjwimpy.com. Check that out. So, yeah. Perfect. Perfect. And that that's interesting. Isn't it always funny? Like like with our daughter, now that you just you know brought that up that you started before you could even walk, it was almost like our daughter too. Like I've I've created some cheesy B rated horror flicks because I just love the oldie, like the old cheesy goodness, you know? And uh <laughs> so our daughter was actually uh portraying the child at, right before she like vanished into thin air, basically in the in the uh, mm -hmm. in the story that we were trying to tell, which is based on true event. But anyway, my two short films are on YouTube, and uh, you can check them out if you would like to. But anyway, I have to. I I'll, I'll tell you what, BJ. I'll send you the uh, the playlist that I made on on YouTube for with both films, and you can have a blast uh, checking those out. <laughs> yeah, please do. Thank you. No problem. And um. So perfect, bjwimpy.com. I would. Yep. That's a. That's always good too. And speaking of which, I gotta ask now. So, um, yeah. So, how does somebody <laughs> get a name like Wimpy for a last name? I guess. Like, where did that come from? Um, I you know looking at my DNA and like from like what my family tells me. I am, you know, part Italian, part English, part Welsh, you know, just a mixing pot. Uh, not really sure where the last name Wimpy came from um, or what, like, you know, like a lot of times last names have like, well, it originally meant this, but then over time, you know, it changed and became this. No idea what Wimpy used to be or how it became to be <laughs> the name that it is now. I will say, though, growing up, it did force me to have a pretty good sense of humor. Um, and even, even still today, like when I introduce myself, people will comment on it and I get to make little jokes about being wimpy. And, um, if you've ever seen Popeye, I always do the line that wimpy, the, the character wimpy says, you know, I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, it's a good time and it makes me laugh and it makes other people laugh. And so I like that. Oh, nothing wrong with that. You know, not like, even a little uh, bit. <laughs> I, uh, there's nothing wrong with that at all. And it just, it's, I don't know. I just never, 
you're like the first person I've ever seen that. And it's almost like um, this other guy that I met in my life before when I used to do traffic control. His last name was Piano. I'm like, what? <laughs> so, so he pulled out his license and he handed it to me. And he's like, yeah, here's proof. Here's my last name. And then what do we write on his identification card? Piano was his last name. I'm like, wow. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I'm really curious sometimes of how people just go, I like that as a last name. I'm going to take that as a last name. <laughs> right, yeah, like when, all, when last names became a thing, like how did that all happen? It's very interesting. Uh, yeah. One good thing, you know, being in my line of work, an actor and voiceover and stuff, it's a unique name. So oh, it definitely, definitely stick, sticks out in people's minds. And, and when they're searching for me, like you did, you know, that there's not that many of us around, so it's pretty easy to, to locate me if you need to. Yeah, and I know we kind of put that in the other segment, but just real quick for people here listening that may not have listened to that. So basically what happened, everybody, is, um, so I found out that our H. Grimley series, uh, Frightland, had an audiobook, one audiobook for the wild man of Shaggy Creek at the time of this recording, just to kind of make it all make sense. But anyway, so I saw the narrator's name, which was BJ Wimpy. And I'm just like, okay, well, now maybe I can try to find this guy. So I go on to Instagram and um, and I type in BJ Wimpy. And there's a few choices that came up. So I clicked on one because I think goodness BJ here put down like he was an actor, he did voice acting and this and that. So I immediately checked, clicked on this profile, saw a bunch of Star Wars cosplay and stuff. And as I'm scrolling down, I'm going, I don't know if this is the right guy, but I'm going to still send him a message. So <laughs> I sent BJ a message and here we are today talking. No, and I'm very glad you did. Uh, and if anyone wants to check it out, yeah, on my on my Instagram and my TikTok and my YouTube channel, what I do most often than not is I dress up like Emperor Palpatine and I do funny, you know, skits and jokes and whatnot as Emperor Palpatine from Star Wars. Uh, it's a good time for sure. And just, uh, you know, again, I started that during the pandemic as a way to have a creative release <laughs> and it's evolved into what it is now. And it's it's a lot of fun. That's that's good to know because like I haven't gotten a chance to see all your stuff, but like from what I did see, it was very good. So, and I was Thank almost thinking, okay, yeah, you know, no problem. And I was like thinking, man, like this guy really loved your Star Wars. So. <laughs> 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 and that I think is why I felt like I had the wrong guy or something because I'm just like, oh, I see a Star Wars. I don't even see anything about Frightway. <laughs> If you scroll down far enough, I do have a couple posts about Frightland, but you probably just, it's been a while. Oh, it definitely sounds like it. But yeah, I mean, either way, it's still a good time. I still had fun messaging. And then afterward, after I sent that message, I'm just like, I really hope this is the right guy. <laughs> well, it was. So good job. <laughs> Yay. I'm usually pretty good. I mean, I do my darnest to like try to really, really figure out if it's like somebody trying to, you know, betray the other person because, you know, that seems to be what's going on with everybody, right? Everybody trying to pretend somebody that they're not. Right, yeah. So anyway, to get on to get back on track here is so talk to us a little bit more, um, BJ. So you you said you started the like audiobook before or, you know, uh, portraying like audiobook format before the pandemic and then during the pandemic it helped you a lot which is good but like explain that process so how how did how did you just be like okay this is what i want to try to narr like you know be a voice actor for for narrating this story did you like go to different publishers that had this specific type of uh specific type of genre or story like how did you decide where you wanted to go well, for the most part, um, I have found most of my jobs through a website called ACX. Um, it's like a backdoor for Audible and uh, Google and iTunes, where it's specifically authors looking for narrators. And so the majority of my jobs I've gotten that way. I've just like, they, they post an audition, I do an audition, and then hopefully I get selected. And I've been lucky enough to be selected several times now. Um, I said in the last interview, but 
uh, this Flightland book is my 16th book, no, 15th book, excuse me. Um, it's my 15th book, my audio book, uh, and the third that is within like the horror genre. Um, and so uh, most of my audiobooks that I've done have been fantasy and sci-fi, uh, that, that sort of vein, and horror very easily fits into the fantasy sci-fi thing as well. Uh, they have a lot of similar tropes and a lot of similar messages that get passed through them. Uh, but uh, I've loved horror ever since I was a little kid. I, I talked in my, the last interview about how Goosebumps was one of the very first books that I ever read through completely by myself as a child. And Frightland definitely gives me that kind of feeling when I'm, when I'm reading through it, that nostalgia for, for that classic children's horror and like, you know, makes me feel tense and a little scared, but not so scared I can't sleep at night sort of thing. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that's how I find my books. And I, I did find Frightland in a different way. And that was because they ran a Kickstarter to get their first four books published and printed. And that was through Bard Press that they ran that Kickstarter. And I noticed that they were also Utah locals. And so I found their website and I reached out to them basically to saying, I saw your Kickstarter. I love, you know, children's horror. I like it. I've loved it since I was a, a kid myself. And if you are looking for an audiobook narrator, I would love the opportunity to audition for you. And they reached back out to me and, and yeah, they were like, well, we hadn't even thought about doing an audiobook. Like, that's a great idea. Uh, yes, we would love for you to audition. Like, and so we did that and they liked it. And then there was a lot of back and forth about the process, especially because they had never done an audiobook. Bard Press had not. And so luckily, you know, since I had done quite a few audiobooks already, I was able to walk them through a little bit of the process. And um, we figured it all out together and we were able to record the first audiobook. And then hopefully we're in talks to do the other three audiobooks as well for this Frightland series so far. Perfect. And I, and I really hope that happens. And I know it's really hard nowadays for audiobooks because you just don't know what's going to happen. But if I may sure. say real quick too, which I almost forgot to throw it out into the, um, the other segment that when we were talking on there for RH's interview is this audiobook for, uh, Frightland, uh, the wild man of Shaggy Creek. It's really not that pricey compared to other audiobooks. So, I mean, if you have like, um, seven dollars to spend for a two hour and eight minute audiobook you know not only are you gonna purchase to support but you're also letting the publisher know that oh look people are getting interested we should make more audiobooks exactly and i believe that's more what what bard press is waiting for right now to see if there is enough interest in this genre as an audiobook uh, like the the young adult uh, or children's horror, um, so far the sales are doing are doing fairly well, and so that's why I think they're looking to proceed. But yeah, if you are if any of you are interested and want to hear more stuff like this, you know the best thing to do is to go and buy the audiobook, buy the print copies, you know, show the publishers that that is what you want, and you know, vote with your wallet, as they say. And so. If you're interested, I I would love the support, but then sure, the Bard Press and everyone would love the support as well. And if it's what you want to hear, what you want to see more of, let them know, and then they will make more of it. Definitely. And I can't express that enough that I would even show support of anybody show, showing support anyway, because um, you, honestly, audiobooks has become like my next new thing when I'm working. You know, I pop in my headphones and kill like two hours listening to an audiobook. Exactly. Like it helps pass the time and it keeps your mind engaged. I, I myself love listening to audiobooks as well. Yeah, and, and and that's the thing, right? Like some authors do it so well too. And I'm not saying like you don't BJ. I'm just trying to say like in general, like you know, like where you start to appreciate the narrator of what they do and how they approach the subject. Because you you know depending on whatever you're listening to, but it it shows it shows how much they um put put interest into the story if if that makes any sense. It does. So I guess uh, so. Bj, 
you know, like you said, you've done quite a bit, like with C, uh, with sci-fi, with uh, some horror elements and stuff like that. And speaking of like horror, you did um, another series called like <clears throat> Shutters, which it looks like it's another three book series. I don't know if there's more, but it's a it's a brand new one. And um, what can you tell us about working with uh, Adrian Turner for Shutters? Yeah, so um, I found Shutters through ACX, like I was talking about earlier, and there's the synopsis sounded really fun, you know, like young adult horror, and I thought that'd be great. Um, one of the funny things about auditioning for that is I auditioned using my normal voice, like I do, and then they actually got back to me, and they said like, oh, you know, we were looking for someone with a British accent to narrate this story. And I said, oh, I can do that. And so then I re-recorded my audition with a British accent. Um, and so that, if you listen to that audiobook series, like that's all done with a British accent um, because the author is actually from uh, over there in the UK. And so that they had that more in their mind. And having, having read the books now and narrated them, the way that some things are phrased, you know, I'm like, oh yes, that is definitely a UK or, or you know, a, a London or England way of, describing that that we normally wouldn't describe it that way in the states right because of everything is just pronounced differently or just in that overseas yeah it's it's crazy exactly but uh i've done two books in that series in the shutter series um uh i'm trying to think of their names now i can only think of shutters <laughs> um, mystery of hilltop uh the side oh, the eye man. Of hilltop and the side eye man yes the mystery of hilltop and the side eye man that's great. Those are the two that I've narrated so far. And they're both a lot of fun. I had a great time doing them. And doing it in a British accent was a lot of fun for me. It, like I said, it, it mixed it up because I normally don't do things in a British accent for, for audiobook narration. Uh, but they're both fun quick. They're very quick little reads, uh, very short. But again, it gives you a lot of like those little hints of horror and those little moments of suspense. Uh, in a very short book, which could be very nice, especially for young readers or young listeners, to not have to commit time. Because some audiobooks uh, can be, you know, hours, if not days long. Like Stephen where King. Some, <laughs> yes, exactly. Like a Stephen King book, if you look at the narration, it's literally like three days long, if you were gonna, going to listen to it all the way through in one sitting. Yeah. But the Shutter series are very short. You know, they're, they're one to two hours. And so you could listen to them in a long car ride or while you're working on something. Um, while, while, while a kid is cleaning their room, they could easily listen to, oh, you know, this, the, the Shutter series. And it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. And I actually think because I did that series, when I saw the Kickstarter for Frightland, I'm like, oh, my gosh, I already have experience in this. And I really enjoyed it. So, like, if I have the opportunity to do another series in that same style, I will, I'm going to jump at it. So, I reached out to Mr. Grimley and, and Bard Press and, you know, put my hat in the ring and lucky, lucky enough was chosen by them. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's awesome. And you get to meet nice people that way. And plus, it's uh, a nice way to uh, grow your worst ethics. I, if, if I, exactly. Uh, and, and I know this isn't, and I know we're going to be talking, well, this is mainly like a horror podcast, but um, at this point in time, it doesn't matter. Like, you, you've you done like a superhero type of uh, audio book as well. I'm trying to remember the name right now. Uh, but... the, the Working Class Superhero Series, yes. <laughs> yes, that one. Well, what? that one's a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> it plays on a lot of the common tropes that you have in superheroes. Like, and some of the characters are very obviously, oh, this is a parody of Superman. This is a parody of Batman. This is a parody of Green Lantern, but with it, their own unique twist on them. And I believe that was a trilogy series as well. And the author actually recently reached out to me that he's writing a fourth uh, book in the series. Uh, but that, that was a lot of fun. One of the favorite books that I've done, uh, I've done two books in the series so far. It's The One-Armed Warlock. And it's a very, it's a, a fantasy uh, with a little bit of like RPG elements to it. So like this guy, you know, like the world kind of all of a sudden starts to exhibit magic and all of these things in our, in our normal world and technology stops working. And he finds that he has this ability 
like when he looks at things, it's kind of like in an RPG game. Like he can see their stats. You know, they have this much intelligence, this much power, this much hit points. And he doesn't understand what's happening to him. But eventually he, he figures it out and he starts becoming a warlock in this new world and leveling himself up as a warlock. And it's just really interesting seeing the magic elements mixed with our modern day society and modern day thinking. Um, and one of the good things about the one-armed warlock is that it, it, the one-armed warlock is not the good guy. He is definitely like a bad guy that you're following. And so you have this like quasi villain that you're kind of rooting for because the whole story is being told from his perspective. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> And there's some horror elements in it too, you know, like he meets mummies in crypts and, and, you know, like werewolves and, and witches and all sorts of things like that. Huh. I'll have to check that out now too. So I got Shudder on our yeah. Warlock to check out from you. Or for, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and like I said before, it helps kill time at, when you're at work. So I'll definitely have exactly. to Exactly. Now, I know it's hard to answer these sometimes, BJ, but have there ever been a project where you felt like you just couldn't do it? Oh, that is hard, especially like, you know, as an actor and as a, as a voiceover artist, you never want to pass up a job <laughs> because right. you never know when you're going to work again. Uh, but I will say I have been approached with some scripts and some books before that, you know, after reading a sample or reading some of it, I'm, I've just been like, ah, you know, not my thing, not, not interested. Thank you for, you know, for thinking of me and thank you for the offer, but not my thing. And it is hard to do that. And, and it's, it's often, it's not like personal. It's not about, not about the work itself or about the author. It's just like, I just am not feeling it. And, exactly. Yeah, I, I hear you. But you know, in the world, it takes all types, you know, like, like so they're going to find another author who's going or another narrator, excuse me, who's going to absolutely love it. And it's, it's going to be their bag. It's going to be their favorite project they've ever worked on. And just yep. for me, I'm like, meh, nah, I'm, I'm okay. But I hope, you know, best of luck. I hope you find the, you know, the narrator that you're looking for. Definitely. And since we're on the subject too, of like trying to ask and you're doing a uh, narration for audiobooks is, so what's the difference like uh, as in for preparing yourself? Uh, for audiobook narration, uh, what's, what's really different is than like regular voiceover work is a lot of the times regular voiceover work, I just get the script and it's just my lines. I don't have the whole story. Um, and so you got to make a lot of guesses and assumptions like reading between the lines. Um, and also a lot of the times with regular uh, voiceover work, you have a director who is there telling you like specifically what they want in this moment and like explaining the scene to you like, okay, in this scene, like you're fighting this character and this is happening. And so keep that in mind while you're doing these lines. I'm like, okay, great. Whereas with audiobook narration, uh, you just, you have the whole story right there in front of you. And mm -hmm. so I, I get the story first or I get the script and I read through the entire book um, at least one time so that I know the story and I know what's coming and I know if like a certain character is supposed to have a certain accent or if something is going to happen later on in the book that I need to foreshadow early on in the book. And so that's a little bit of a different process. Also with audiobook narration, for the most part, I'm doing it on my own. Um, yes, I'll have a conversation with the author or with the publisher or, or whomever like that, but normally it's a very, very short conversation giving me basics of what they think they want. And then I just go and do it myself. Um, I, you know, I record, I edit, and then submit it to them. Uh, most of the time they have like the first few chapters to make any major edits that they can foresee for the rest of the book. But then after that, like I'll take their advice and I'll take their, their, you know, their direction. But then I, I do the rest of it on my own. And based on what they gave me for the first few chapters and the changes that we made in the first few chapters, that is what I will base the rest of the audio book on. And so, like I said, it's a little, it's a little different because I don't have someone there directing me the whole time. Yeah, that makes sense. Like, 
like, um, I must be, like, I don't want to say the worst, like, director ever, but then again, I'm one of those type of guys where when I was doing, like, my, my cheesy, you know, B-rated films here, it was like, I know I'm trying to be serious when directing, but I'm also trying to let everybody have their turn of suggestion because, you know, if they have something that I didn't think of, maybe maybe I should listen, you know, because maybe it might actually be better than what we were trying to uh, originally plan out for scene-wise or something. Or in this yeah. case, like, um, like uh, the next one that we're trying to do, and thanks to COVID, it had to get pushed a little bit. But um, this summer, I'm hoping to finish that up. And it's like a found footage. So basically, that idea is more like we're going to be bouncing off of each other because it's not really in a written script, but we act, but we still know what we need to do. Mm -hmm. no, yeah. That definitely makes sense. Yeah, and oh. it's probably not like the best way, and sorry to cut you off for a minute, but it's, it's not oh, like fine. the best way, but, you know, it's like a way of also teaching yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, one of my uh, professors from college and one of my favorite directors, you know, he told me that the director's purpose, you know, number one is to cast good actors and good people. Because if you cast a good actors who know what they're doing and are passionate about their work, most of your job is done for you. Because those actors will, they'll bring their own ideas and they'll bring their own feelings and thoughts to the process that will help make it better than if you just rely on only the, the director's vision. Um, yes, the director is there to, to rein things in and to make sure everything is cohesive, but if they listen to their actors and listen to like suggestions of these other very talented people whom they've surrounded themselves with, it can make a very beautiful collaborative process, which is better than what it could have been on its own. And that makes complete sense as well. And yeah. Um, I, uh, yeah, you should, you almost see that a lot sometimes, maybe like in the older films, you can kind of see like, like if it wasn't for the actors, like it feels like the movie wasn't going to be that good or something exactly. like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess BJ is from the 15, 15 books that you have had the chance to record a narration for, um, which one do you feel like took you the longest to record to get done? Because I'm assuming it's because you wanted to make sure you were getting it right. Um, so for that one, it would probably be my very first audiobook, which was the One-Armed Warlock book one. And it's because, like I said, it's my very first audiobook. And it's a very, di it's, audiobook narration is very different than other voiceover work that I had done before or live acting, you know, work that I had done before. Um, also, there was a, a high learning curve because a lot of times with audiobooks, not only am I the voiceover artist, but then I am also the, I'm, I'm the editor. So I have to go through and like, if something doesn't sound right, I have to fix that either by re-recording it or by altering it in the, the software. Um, it's my job to set the pacing. It's my job to uh, figure out where I need longer pauses, where I need shorter pauses, um, taking out like loud breaths or other sounds that happen to get recorded. So there was a very steep learning curve on my very first audio book, which was, like I said, the One-Armed Warlock book one. But luckily the author was so um, wonderful at dealing with me and very patient with me as it took me a little bit extra time than we had agreed on in our initial contract just because I wanted it to be so good and I was so unfamiliar with the entire process myself. Um, uh, the author for the one on Warlock series, his name is, is Dural White. And we've actually been able to like very form a friendship over the, the few years that we've known each other just through his audiobooks and my narration and just getting to talk about them. Like, we've become friends. Like we send each other Christmas cards and, you know, we chat online every once in a while. It's great. Uh, but his first book was probably my hardest just because I had no idea what I was fully doing and had to teach myself on the fly. Fair enough. Yeah. And, and it's yeah. always, it's always um, scary. Like when you first take your step into like a whole new um, playground, as I may say, because 
you know, obviously, like you've mentioned, you're not familiar with the process and stuff. So um, it's good that people actually took the time, though, to basically give you an idea while, uh, you know, while you're doing the process. So mm -hmm. because, you know, it's kind of like in a real job, right? Like if we weren't talking, like if I wasn't talking to you and I wasn't doing this as like a hobby or whatever you want to call it, basically, but like. If I had like a regular job nine to five, the only way to get experience is by, you know, getting that type of job where you're going to get the experience. But then when jobs, uh, specific jobs, I'll say, want you to have this specific like type of experience and you don't have any, it's like, well, how come, how can I even get that type of experience if I can never get my foot through the door? to get that experience. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean like you can you can yeah, you can go to school, you can get all the training in the world, but until you actually work that job and actually get your hands on, yeah, you're you it's going to be completely different. And so yeah, I'm very grateful to to Dura White, uh, the author for giving me that opportunity and that chance and helping me. And then in return, you know, I was able to turn around and help Bard Press with their production of The Wild Man of Shaggy Creek because they that was their very first step into the audiobook world as well and you know i think there's enough room for all of us to succeed and for all of us to help each other you know a high tide raises all ships and so with my mm -hmm. like you know girl helping me with his experience and then me being able to help bard press with, bard press with their experience hopefully in the future you know if they do another series they can find another narrator and help that narrator i just think you know like yeah you all you need to get that hands-on experience and giving people those opportunities is great because, you know, you may unlock the future, like best audiobook narrator. And I'm not, I wasn't saying that about myself, but just in the future, someone, because of someone got a chance, they could become something great. An actor, an audiobook narrator, uh, a, a welder, a craftsman, you know, a, a waiter, anything, any job, maybe like the next person who tries it will be the best one ever. And so I think, I think that's a great, and I'm very grateful that I had that opportunity. And, you know, and if it wasn't for that opportunity there, BJ, we wouldn't even be talking right now. It's true. Yeah, we would have never had the pleasure of meeting each other. Exactly. And that, and I find that to always be a cool thing. I love to pick other people's minds, even though sometimes I might feel like I lost my train of thought in some interviews where you probably hear me go, um, uh, yeah, uh. But then again, it's like, you know, um, ex perfect example, BJ, is, um, so I do another podcast off the, the side of doing this one and in that mm -hmm. one it's called haunted vermont for and this is also for everybody else listening but if you would like to know local war and ghost stories of my home state feel free to go check out haunted vermont but anyway so i had my latest guest on haunted vermont right came on and so the story the short version of this is I was prepared for this guy at first, but then mm -hmm. as soon as he came on, I would not prepared anymore <laughs> because, <laughs> because basically what happened was um, he stopped, he stopped updating his website. So I couldn't really see what, what projects he really worked on because I know he's been around forever because he would want to know type of guy. But anyway, so as I, um, asked him to give us like a brief bio of of himself this is basically what he throws at me and this is where my whole entire brain explodes so i became like uh, e, uh, uh like i just felt like i was unprepared anymore because i had like only three things to talk about and then he throws this at me but anyway so the guy his name is uh steven Bissett. And he is one of the pencil artists that worked on the saga of Swamp Thing back with Alan Moore. Oh, that's and, great. That's a great and, and I didn't know this. And yet this guy is in who lived also in my home state, Vermont. And it's just like, 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 how do I even like, how do I compete with this? Like, you know, <laughs> so that's but yeah, great. that's my yeah. 
But yeah, in there you can definitely hear my voice going, uh, um, because it's just like, well, what, what do you like? How do you not like prepare yourself after hearing that? Like seriously. <laughs> but right, yeah, um, like, 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 oh, okay, it's great. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, um, yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, no, he he was awesome to talk with too, and his his interview was an hour and fifty minutes, but Jesus, <laughs> uh, that great, that. Had, Oh yeah, and that had a lot of fun stuff, and I learned a lot too about like, like a cool technique that he used for like a specific poster that he made, and I never would have thought of it. But uh, anyway, I let him tell it in that interview if anybody's interested. So, um, um, so with that being said, BJ is so you kind of mentioned you act for a commercial you starred in your first film there when you couldn't even walk and stuff. But, um, and throughout, like, I get the years of trying to act. How do you, how did you teach yourself to become an actor? Because I, you know, you hear, like, I used to practice like in the mirror. I used to just like, uh, replay scenes from, uh, movie TV shows. So what, did, what were you doing to, uh, to prepare yourself into the acting career? Um, well, as a child, I, I was always an entertainer. I loved entertaining people, making them laugh, making them smile. Um, even if it was just making faces, you know, at, at a, a kid in church, you know, and making him smile. But, you know, early on with Aladdin and Robin Williams voiceover work in that, Mm -hmm. I, I would mimic the genie's scenes in Aladdin over and over and over again as a child, and I just loved it, and I thought it was brilliant. Um, and so then through the years, though, you know, I did get formal training, uh, you know, taking obviously like the, the, the drama and choir classes in high school and junior high, but as an adult, you know, taking acting classes from other places as well. Um, I do have a college degree in musical theater. Oh, wow. Um, so I do sing as well, <laughs> um, but a lot of it is kind of what we talked about is just hands on, you know, get yourself involved in a community theater or just in, in little side projects like what you're making. You know, if, there, if you have a friend who wants to make a, a, a silly B horror movie, do it. You know, even if you're not experienced, you got to start somewhere. So, you know, get that experience just by doing it is one of my, is what I suggest. And for um, voiceover work, I did, I took a couple, you know, online courses. I've done some in-person courses. And you can always learn something from everyone. So whenever you're working on a project or whenever you're um, around anyone who is doing what you want to do, you know, pay attention, listen, ask questions uh, is the best way to gain that experience and to train yourself for in the future when you can actually take advantage and do that job. So yeah, that's that's how that's how I did it myself was just uh, first, you know, just doing it myself as a kid and goofing around, but then eventually getting formal training and then still to this day, every time I'm working on a set or I'm working on a new voiceover project, ask as many questions as you can of people who know more than you. Learn something from every project and from every person you work with. That's that's what I always try to do in my life. Yeah, and that, you know that that, and I one hundred percent agree with you. Like, in order to do it, you just got to put your foot into through the door of whatever project it is, really, and then that's how you're going to not only teach yourself, but you're going to learn other things from other people being around that same project and so on. So exactly, and uh, so BJ, um. I guess uh, before we end the uh, little conversation here, is, is there any type of project that we haven't touched on that you would like to share? Um, nothing that I can think of. Uh, I think we've covered a, a very broad base of, of you know, me. <laughs> um, but if we're circling back to horror, you know, go and listen to H.R. Grimley's Frightland that I was able to work on. And uh, also, Adrian Turner's uh, Shutters series; those are both horror, and you know, just go out there and make stuff happen, guys. <laughs> Have fun. Exactly. And so, I guess real quick, BJ, is is there any project in the work now that you're working on? 
Um, I actually, last night, I closed a play that I was in. I was playing Long John Silver in an uh, onstage version of Treasure Island, which was oh, just amazing. Nice. That was at Health, at Health Center Theater here in Utah, and it was such an amazing project to work on. Um, I am currently working on an audio book. It's called uh, The Drag Queen Detective, book three. Um, it's uh, like a kind of a murder mystery detective series thing, like but done by a drag queen, which I think is awesome. It makes me happy. <laughs> um, I I'm in talks with Bard Press to do the future, of uh, the future Frightland book, and then coming up, I have more auditions for a, a few commercials. Oh, actually, I just auditioned for a TV series, a docu series that's going to be coming out, called uh, Lost Time which is about alien abduction. Ooh. Um, I don't know whether or not I've been cast in that yet, but I did just film uh, several auditions for that. So, you know, fingers crossed. But that's the life of a, an actor and a voiceover artist and everything is that you're always looking for the next job. And so, yes, I have a few things that are in the work, but I'm always looking for more work. And if you ever need an audiobook narrator or a voiceover artist or actor, please reach out to me at my website, bjwimpy.com. I would love to hear from any of you. Uh, follow him on my socials, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, uh, YouTube, all that stuff. If you search BJ Wimpy, I'm sure you'll find me. But yeah, that's what I'm working on for right now. <laughs> nice. But we'll just, we'll just clarify. So when you look for BJ Wimpy, if you see a bunch of Star Wars, that might be him, just so you know. <laughs> it's probably me, yeah, because I do that Emperor Palpatine Star Wars stuff a lot. <laughs> yes, he does. And that's not a bad thing. It's just like how I found him. So that's why, like I said it before, is I would make sure this is him. So I took the chance of messaging. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm All very right. glad you did. Oh, me too. And it's been a pleasure, BJ. And speaking of which, for projects, is there any type of project that you would love to get your fingers into that you would love to totally like narrate or act in? Um, I, I would love to do a horror series or a horror movie. Like, you know, a, a lot of famous actors have gotten their big breaks by doing a horror movie, like some B horror movie or, C, or, or you know, and so I would love to be in a horror film. I think that'd be great. Um, bring it on, right? Like, I would love to be in that process and, and to have that experience. Definitely. And, I, and, I, and I'll be rooting for you. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And then you can say I knew him when. <laughs> well, well, if anybody needs a reference, like, you know, kind of like what a job application is, you need references, I'll, I'll, put, you, I'll put me down and I'll be like, dude, this guy, just, just do it. This guy's amazing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll keep that in mind for sure. <laughs> yeah. How do you know BJ? Oh, um, I've known him for a few years. <laughs> I interviewed him on a podcast once. <laughs> yeah, I put him on a podcast, but we met. We know each other beforehand. It's, uh, that way, it sounds legit, too. <laughs> that, right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, how, how else do you know him? Um, I'm pretty sure he used to live by me, I think. I think pretty that's sure, how we pretty sure. <laughs> Well, it said that he's only moved, he's only been in Utah. Oh, um, I meant he must have been on a business trip, right? He must have been. <laughs> uh, all right, BJ. Well, you kind of, you know, answered the final question, which is where we can keep up to date and everything, which you said it, uh, bjwimpy.com, but feel free to say that one more time. So where can everybody keep up to date with you? Yeah, please. So you can visit my website, bjwimpy.com. Uh, follow me on TikTok uh, and Instagram, and there you can find me, Wimpy BJ. On YouTube, I'm BJ Wimpy. And uh, yeah, that's how you can find me. And I'd love to, to chit chat more with, with you or with anyone else who would, who would be interested. Well, I would love to chit chat with you more, BJ, especially when more stuff um, comes out. And maybe once I. Uh listen to the Shutter series and the one arm warlock that would be interesting to talk about i bet too i would but, love to talk about either of those with you all right bj well i appreciate your time and thank you again and um i just look forward to the future talks and for everybody else listening thank you all very much for listening to the episode and keep up with both of us and all the links will be thrown in the 
episode description below so you don't have to do too much work because I've already done all the work for you. But anyway, yes, did. anyway, um, yeah, I mean, I don't really know what else to say except for just keep up to date and like always, stay scary, everybody. <laughs>